Um, thanks for inviting me here tonight. I'm really excited to be here. My name is Leanne Baronet. Um, I am part of the industry team at Rocky Mountain Institute. I just want to um, um, make it clear right now that I am the communications lead for our team. So I'm not going to dive deep into numbers and technical details and that sort of thing, because that's not what I do. I'm more focused on how people process information and make decisions and how we can use that as a factor to drive change. So I'm going to be focused on mostly our theory of change and the work that we're doing to, to change people's behaviors. But we do a lot of really interesting stuff. And so if you have questions on the technical side, you know, throw them at me. If I can't answer them, I'll make sure I follow up with you and get you the answer that you need. Um, so I'm going to start. I'll give you guys a brief overview of Rocky Mountain Institute and what we do. I'm sure a lot of you probably have heard of RMI or even those of you who haven't and don't know what we do, like have some vague sense of what RMI is. But I'll go through it a little bit, talk about our current programs, um, talk about something called the Seven Challenges, which is a new framework that we developed last year to think about the energy transition. And then I'll get into RMI's industry program, talk about our theory of change, and then give you guys as quick of an overview as possible about the work we do, um, which won't be quick because we do a lot. <laughs> so I think a lot of you probably know that RMI is an independent, nonpartisan nonprofit. We were founded by Amory Lovins in 1982 in a little office in Aspen, Colorado. We've grown a lot. We're growing tremendously, something like 20 to 30 percent year over year. And we now have approximately I'd say about 230 people, full-time staff, working in offices in Boulder, Basalt, New York, DC, Oakland, and we also have an office in Beijing. Um, it's not open right now, but um, we do typically have staff there. Those guys are unfortunately working from home for the foreseeable future. RMI is uh, technically a think tank, but we like to say that we're a think and do tank, and that's because we're focused on not just coming up with ideas, but taking those ideas and getting them out into the real world and watching them actually happen. So our theory of change is think, do, scale. Coming up with ideas, doing them, coming up with projects to demonstrate how they work, getting feedback from that, going back, iterating. And then finally, when we have a solution that is really impactful, finding ways to scale that and make as big of an impact as possible. Um, we do this by engaging directly with businesses, communities, institutions, and entrepreneurs to speed the transition from fossil fuels to efficiency and renewables. And I think that's one thing that really sets us apart from other NGOs. It's that we have this techno-economic focus and that we do partner directly with industry. This diagram, we call this the RMI Universe Diagram. And although it looks pretty complex, it's actually a simpler way to talk about all of the work that we're doing across our programs and across different areas. Um, this is, I would say, changing a little bit um, because we're beginning to change how we look at the challenge of the energy transition. But you can see that we work in all sorts of sectors from electricity and buildings to mobility to working directly with cities and states and other governments like China and India. Um, and then also in industry and hard to abate sectors. Although we're seeing progress towards reducing greenhouse gas emissions in the work that we've been doing at RMI, I think we all know that we're really badly off track to keep global warming between below two degrees, let alone 1.5 degrees, which is what a lot of us think we need to do. Um, so because of that, last year, RMI identified seven challenges for, energy, for the energy transition. These are things that we think need to be addressed now in order to get us on a pathway to um, net zero by 2050, or 50% emissions reductions by 2030. And these are things that we think need collective action and a, an effective collaboration to do so. So we can't work in silos anymore. We have to work together, and we have to work cross-sectorally. I'll cover each of these really briefly. They're very new, and I will say that they're still taking shape at RMI. It's not like we've, we came out with these, we released the report, and then we restructured the organization to fit under each of these. That's still something that's happening. Um, so we've got number one, making emissions visible. So this is about how we can improve the transparency and accountability of emissions data and use that to drive faster greenhouse gas emission reductions. Two is tripling energy productivity gains. So how can we improve design of new buildings and infrastructure? 
and then get rid of inefficient assets faster. Three, electrifying with renewables. This is about generating ideas for expanding renewables and increasing electricity as part of our global energy consumption as quickly as we possibly can. Number four, reinventing cities. So working with cities and governments to make urban systems and infrastructures cleaner and more efficient. Number five, boosting clean technology. So speeding the development and adoption of high impact clean energy technologies. Number six, my favorite, <laughs> redesigning industry. This is about shifting the way we produce, transport, and use energy and materials in the products and infrastructure that surround us every day. Number seven, financing a swift and fair transition. This is about a just transition to new forms of energy. So finding something that brings all of us along, not just people in the developed world, but people in developing economies as well. I just want to put a plug in here that um, the work of our islands team falls under this, under number seven. And that work, specifically the work we're doing in Puerto Rico, is going to be featured on 60 Minutes this Sunday. So be sure to check that out if you can. I think that, you know, so we're starting to look at these seven challenges and use them as a way to shape how we're thinking and shape how they're driving our work. And we're trying to, to find opportunities where a really small change can have really big results. Um, and so, as you can see, RMI's industry program, which has existed for a few years now, is part of it. It's number six. It's a really important part of the problem and it's something that we need to address. Our, our program um, has the mission to decarbonize the world's goods and services, including how they're designed, sourced, produced, and delivered. So that means focusing on emissions across the entire value chain. That means starting with the raw materials that, are, that go into the product. So the raw materials, the metals, the copper, all that sort of thing that went into this laptop that I'm using right now. So starting with how those are extracted from the ground, how those raw materials are transported to, um, to a facility to be, to be processed, the energy that goes into processing those materials um, to transform them, and then the fuels that are used to transport the final products and commodities to end consumers. If you look across the value chains of these um, heavy industries and you add up all of those emissions, it actually equals 40% of annual greenhouse gas emissions each year, which is huge. So this is a really big problem and it needs to be addressed. And our team is focused on doing just that. Okay, so framework for the industry program. What is the RMI's industry, RMI's industry program? We're focused on um, decarbonizing the value chains that go into delivering consumer goods and services. So that includes materials, so things like steel, cement, and plastic, energy, like oil and gas, hydrogen, and biofuels, and transportation, shipping, trucking, and aviation. Um, you could include rail in that as well. We don't actually work on rail right now, so I don't have it on the list, but, but someday maybe we will. We're focused on this because, as I mentioned, it's incredibly important. More than 40% of total greenhouse gas emissions each year come from these hard-to-abate sectors. They also use 20% of global coal consumption, which is really, really big. Um, but these sectors are called hard to abate. They're called hard to abate for a reason. Uh, that's because they're really, really slow to change. And I think a lot of these industries would argue with you and say that like, it's impossible to change. The steel industry, especially the steel industry in the United States, says that you know, it's really difficult to change. It takes too long. It's too expensive. It's going to be too expensive for end consumers. But we don't think that's true. You know, these guys do have a, stat, a track record of evading regulations. They very much like the status quo. They have invested big time in long life assets. So things that are going to be around for 20, 30, 40 years. So if the industry changes and technology changes really rapidly, that really hurts the return on investment for these assets. So they push really hard and lobby really hard for things to stay the same. The way their business models are structured also makes it really difficult to have transparency into their operations. And one thing I'm going to talk about a little bit later is the difficulty also in, in tracking emissions along the value chain, especially scope three emissions. That's something that's really difficult to manage. Um, and we are working on a solution to that. But like I said, we do believe that change is possible. We're starting to see that 
there's pressure from consumers, there's investor pressure as well, and so those things are driving corporate behavior. Um, there's also research that I'll talk about in a little bit that shows that the cost of change is not actually that large, that it's really insignificant in the end. And you know, I think we've all seen that markets can shift really, really quickly. So what we're doing is we're focused on using market mechanisms um, and redirecting capital. There are a number of different ways that you can create change. There's essentially three, three levers for change, market interventions, policy intervention, and financial intervention. Uh, the industry program is focused on market interventions. We have another team at RMI, our global climate, global climate finance team, and they are focused on using finance as a lever for change. And RMI does not do any policy work directly. Um, we're not a policy shop, but we do provide guidance on policy. So we, we are active across all three of them, some more than others. Another thing about these industries, we don't really talk about heavy, heavy industry on a daily basis. Um, it's something we kind of, we kind of avoid. I, I call these industries, I affectionately call them dirty, smelly, and ugly. Um, and so I think that, you know, people avoid them for those reasons. They're not warm, they're not cuddly, and that sort of thing. But they are a very important part of our everyday lives. They go into literally everything that we touch and use and buildings that we live in on a daily basis. And, you know, if you add up all of the industry subsectors that are in the scope for our program, they represent 50% of revenue and assets in the Forbes 100. So they're a really, really big part of our everyday lives. Um, it's, a, it's a big deal though, you know, because they touch everything and we've noticed that consumer behavior is changing, which I think is great because that's a, a big mechanism for pressure. More and more companies are coming out with climate commitments. I think, you know, one of the biggest that we've seen, I think it was just a few weeks ago, Microsoft announced that it's going to be carbon negative by 2030. And then not only that, by 2050, they said they're gonna remove, they'll have removed all of the carbon that they as a company have emitted, emitted since their founding in 1975, including carbon from electricity consumption, which is great. I don't, I don't know how they're gonna do it, <laughs> but I think it's an amazing ambition and it's great that we have companies like that um, putting out goals like that. Dominion Energy also last week or the week before pledged to go uh, net zero by 2050. And then BP around that time also had an announcement with something like 10 new climate ambitions, uh, including one to be net zero by 2050. And you know, you can argue that it was a very fuzzy uh, commitment. They didn't really give any details on how they're gonna make it happen and they left some things out. But I think it still highlights that this is becoming a big issue for co corporations and it's something that's in the public eye and, I, and that's not gonna change. It's only gonna continue to grow. Like I said, the cost um, for these types of changes, for these decarbonization strategies for heavy, heavy industry are actually really marginal for end consumers in the end. So one of the things that you'll hear from, from big industries like the steel industry, I, I pick on the steel industry a lot because I grew up in Pittsburgh, so it's a steel town, and I actually, right out of college, my very first job was working for US Steel, so I, f I feel like I can pick on them. <laughs> um, you know, they'll say, oh, it's so expensive, and if we do that, then prices are gonna increase dramatically, you know, the cost of your car is gonna double, and so it's in the best interest for everyone if we just keep things the way they are. But that is actually not true at all. Um, about a year ago, the Energy Transition Commission, or ETC, our friends at ETC, released a report called Mission Possible. And what they found is that the cost to end consumers is actually really, really small in the end. So for a new car, the cost, the decarbonization cost for the steel in the end on that new car is $180 for a $20,000 car. I don't know that a $20,000 car exists anymore, but it's still you know, gonna be less than $500 or around $500 for a new car, which is really not that big of a deal. Um, for clothing, for you know, more common consumer goods like that, the cost to decarbonize shipping ends up being something like 30 cents on a $60 pair of jeans. So, so that's really just not a valid argument. These are things that are really inexpensive to do and won't cost us a lot. It'll be very marginal. And I think that most people would probably agree that it's something that's worth, worthwhile to do. Um, I mentioned earlier that we use market, me market mechanisms to drive change. 
And we do that in what we like to call a combination of push-pull mecha mechanisms to drive change in the industry. So on one end, we have things like customer demand for greener pro products, um, product differentiation and price premiums, pulling these industries towards um, decarbonization. On the other side, you've got uh, the need for transparency, you've got pressure from industry organizations and things like that, and then also pressure from investors and regulatory pressure. I know that's not happening on a national level necessarily right now, but there still is you know, um, industry regulations, state regulations, local regulations, and that sort of thing. Um, so all of this combines to, to exert pressure on all sides and, um, and really help make this change happen from a market perspective. Okay, I wanna start to get into the work that we are actually doing in the industry program. Uh, I'll we'll talk a little bit about our materials initiative, our energy inputs initiative, and then our freight and transport initiatives as well. Um, our materials initiative, it's, it actually started as a mining initiative, and I think they were formed as some, in 2015. They were called Sunshine for Mines. And um, they worked directly with mining companies with the goal of getting as much renewable capacity as possible installed on mine sites. A lot of times that was um, old mine sites that weren't being used anymore because you have these really vast open spaces. A lot of times they're in sort of desert-like environments. Um, the, the, the sites can be contaminated for a number of reasons, and so the, the property is just kind of going to waste. It can't really be used for a lot more, and it's really prime for um, solar installation. So when the program started in 2015, they had a goal of installing 1.4 gigawatts of renewable capacity on mine sites by 2022. At the end of last year, they had actually installed 4.9 gigawatts. Um, which I think is a really good example of under-promising and over-delivering. <laughs> um, so it's fantastic that that's happening. We want to think that that has a lot to do with our program, and I'm sure on some level it does. Um, I think also, too, you know, this coincided with uh, a dramatic decrease in price on the storage side of things, um, which is a big part of it as well. But these companies, mining companies especially, are increasingly concerned with social license to operate. So the communities that they're in are really demanding that um, they have ethical business practices and, and that they um, take care of the land that they're using. And mining companies are becoming more and more aware of this. And so that is also driving these decisions that they're making. Um, so even though what we're doing on Sunshine for Mines is great and that work is still continuing, it's not enough. We need to do more to address the seven gigatons of annual emissions that come from materials. So that's from mining, from steel, and cement. Um, cement is actually a really high emitter. It's a, it's a really carbon intensive process. Uh, one thing I wanna say, I know most of you probably know what a gigaton is and know that that's a lot, um, but one of the things that we fight against when trying to talk to people and communicate with them about how bad this problem is, is that it's so big that it feels so unmanageable for people. And there's this really great article in, I think it was the Washington Post about a year ago, it was ca called actually, What is a Gigaton? And it talked about how one of the problems that we have dealing with climate change is that it's such a big issue and the way we talk about it is so intangible to people that it's hard for people to grasp it and therefore take action on it. And so the article was sort of about, you shouldn't talk about gigatons, you should talk about what that means in terms of like elephants or, or something physical that people can imagine. Um, so to put that into perspective for you, seven gigatons is equal to a year's worth of electricity, the emissions from a year's worth of electricity from 1.2 billion homes, and that's about 10 times the number of homes in the US. So that's a, that's a lot. Um, so to try to tackle more of those emissions, you know, we realized that we really needed to look not just at a sector, sector, not go sector by sector, but look across the entire value chain. And so we have started something called the Coalition on Materials Emissions Transparency. 
um, which we call Comet for short. We just launched this last month, still February, right? Yeah, so we just launched it in January at um, WEF's annual event in Davos. This is a partnership. We're working, um, RMI is working with MIT's Sustainable Supply Chains Initiative, the Columbia Center for Sustainable Investment, and the Payne Institute for Public Policy at Colorado School of Mines here in Golden. And the idea is to come together and bring industry stakeholders together and investors and regulators from across the value chain to create a universal greenhouse gas calculation framework for the mineral and industrial supply chains. The reasons behind this are pretty simple. Basically, until people know the climate impact of the products they're using, it's impossible to demand cleaner goods. You know, I don't know if this laptop is greener than anybody else's laptop. And that's, that's something we need to have. Just like we have nutrition information on the food that we eat, we need to have emissions information on the products that we're using. Um, and until we have that, it's really going to be impossible to drive decarbonation in these industrial sectors. But we've talked about how companies are facing pressure to decarbonize their operations, and a lot of them do honestly want to make changes. Um, but the problem is, without a way to uh, get a clear picture of those emissions, it's not going to happen. You know, we all know that you can't manage what you can't measure. You need a, a verifiable and and comparable way to look, look at your scope three emissions across the value chain. Um, there are existing methods to do this. I don't want to say that we're coming up with something t entirely new that doesn't already exist. There's actually a lot of stuff out there that tries to do this. But the thing is, there's no consistency in data or reporting, and there's no framework that goes across the supply chain. So this is where Comet comes in. The goal for Comet is that it's going to enable producers, buyers, and investors to achieve climate targets. And it's going to do that by having a standard methodology that can be used across commodities and supply chains. To build it, we're not starting completely from scratch. We're going to leverage existing platforms and tools. Um, so we're going to make use of what's already out there and what people are already using. And we're going to collaborate with industry and, and existing stakeholders um, to work together to make something that's really valuable and useful. OK, let's talk about our energy inputs team. Uh, these guys are reducing the carbon intensity of fuels used to produce and transport, transport goods. Um, their big focus is on methane. And methane is a super potent greenhouse gas. I don't know if you guys have heard about it a lot. It's starting to be talked about more, but it still doesn't get the same amount of attention as CO2. And that's a shame, because it's actually 80 times more powerful than CO2 over a 20-year time frame. It doesn't stick around as long, but the time that it's here, it's really intense and powerful. Uh, one of the reasons why methane is becoming such an issue, and it's such an important thing for us to address, is that you know, we've had this shift to natural gas for a lot of reasons in the US. And people talk about it and try to sell it as a cleaner burning fossil fuel. And that's true, it is cleaner burning than coal, but it's still a fossil fuel. And in addition, it leaks methane. And as we know, methane is really, really, really bad. Uh, it's estimated that increasing methane concentrations in the atmosphere are actually going to cause one quarter of the global warming that we experience in the next 20 years. And the oil and gas industry is responsible for something like 14 to 20 percent of these emissions. So RMI is working to get rid of, like, to get rid of gas everywhere. That's ultimately we what we want. We don't want to encourage the use of gas. But we're realistic about the fact that we're not going to get rid of it tomorrow. We're not going to get rid of it next year. We're probably not going to get rid of it fully in the next 10 years. So because of that, as long as we have natural gas that's being used, it needs to be as clean as possible. So because of that, our team is partnering with oil and gas companies, um, governments, and civil society to eliminate fugitive methane emissions from the natural gas value chain. Our goal is an 80% reduction in methane emissions by 2050. To do that, we're creating um, a certification standard for low methane emissions gas. So this is a market mechanism that we're creating to try to get in place to help motivate oil and gas companies to reduce their methane emissions. And we're doing that by, you know, if you produce gas 
that's lower emissions. We have a way to certify it as a greener product, and therefore it's a premium product, and you can charge more money for it. We're doing this because, believe it or not, buyers are actually demanding it, and producers can even earn a financial incentive um, if they've done a really good job of the abatement, and that can actually help offset the cost of the abatement itself. So the way that it works is companies will self-report. So they'll report on their methane emissions intensity. They're going to be subjected to high-frequency monitoring. There's also going to be an independent um, monitoring component that goes on. Those results will be reported. There will be verification and auditing to make sure that everything matches up. And if it does, the gas will be certified as um, low methane emissions, then it's a premium product and it can be sold as such. We're doing this work also, I should say, here in the US, primarily in, we're focused on Texas, um, but we're also doing this work in Europe as well. Um, Europe does seem like it's poised to move a little faster on uh, methane regulations than we are, as, as you guys probably know. The Trump administration is in the process of rolling back EPA uh, methane regulations from the previous administration, um, but you know Europe, they are often a lot more progressive than we are. They see that this is an issue, and they're starting to um, make movements on the policy side to put tougher regulations in place in terms of natural gas and methane. And whether or not the oil and gas industry here wants to um, believe it, that's going to have an effect because we export so much of the gas we produce here in the US and we export a lot of that to Europe and if they have tougher regulations and, and we are not able to meet them, that's gonna be a problem. Um, to help with that standard, we're also developing um, an analytic tool. We're calling it the Climate Action Engine and, and it's gonna blend modeled and measured data to get a, a better, more precise picture of fugitive emissions from oil and gas operations. The tool is, you know, that I'm not doing it justice, it's actually very complex, but essentially it's gonna take in data from a variety of different sources. You use really smart algorithms to process and filter that data, and then, and then output it for a variety of end uses. Our energy team also works on hydrogen, which is a super popular topic right now. Um, anytime RMI writes anything about hydrogen, it's, it's hands down um, the most popular piece. Um, the work that we're doing here is new and evolving, but we've primarily been focused on using hydrogen as a fuel source for high process heats like steel making. We've done some exploration on it in the um, heavy transport side as well, um, mostly for long haul, um, long haul trucks and things like that. And I do want to say really quickly that one of my colleagues, um, the Colorado Clean Tech Industries Association is having an event, I forget what it's called, sometime in March, maybe March 19th, about hydrogen. Um, and one of my colleagues is gonna be speaking at that. So if you're interested in hydrogen, check it out. It'd be a really cool event to go to. Um, but so in January, we published a new report about um, hydrogen's decarbonization impact for industry. And it was really focused on primarily, primarily around steel making, but other sources, uh, other other processes that you could use hydrogen for. Um, the bottom line, hydrogen is, central, is essential for a 1.5 degree pathway, even a two degree pathway. For a lot of industrial processes, there's no other decarbonization option out there right now. How you make the hydrogen is important. Green hydrogen is good, that's what we want. Uh, but our research found that you don't need to have green hydrogen in order for hydrogen to have a decarbonization impact. The, the truth is that in some countries and geographies, the grid is actually green enough today that if you produced hydrogen with electrolysis using that grid power and then use that hydrogen to fuel certain processes like steel making, it actually would be less CO2 intensive than it is with what we're using today. So this is a chart, I'm sorry, I think it's a little fuzzy and I'm sure you can't even see it at all <laughs> given, the, given the projector, um, but this is in our, is in a recent insight brief, which you can download from our, um, from our website. And it essentially shows um, 
the CO2 intensity of, grid, of the grid from different geographies, so the EU, Sweden. I have to tell you that uh, one of the members on our team who wrote this report, he's from Sweden, so every time he does something, he compares it to Sweden. Um, <laughs> but they're doing great. They're way over there on the uh, left side with a super clean grid. Um, so it, it shows the CO2 intensity of the grid in these various geographies and then shows where that intersects with the CO2 intensity of um, certain processes and things like that. In addition to having this in a report that we can, you can download, we actually have an interactive website where you can go and like customize it and, and, and look at the data in any way you want. So um, I definitely encourage you to check that out because it's some pretty neat stuff and it, and it kind of is, um, you know, it makes the point that you don't have to wait for green hydrogen. We can start decarbonizing with hydrogen today. Okay, last but not least, our freight and transport team. I love these guys. This team is working to break the link between the growing demand for heavy transport and CO2 emissions. A lot of this work is in zero carbon trucking, so working on battery electric technologies in urban and regional markets, and then battery electric or hydrogen fuel cell technologies in long haul markets. We do a lot of our work on the trucking side with an organization called the North American Council for Freight Efficiency, NACFI. This is a fantastic industry organization. Love these guys, can't say enough good things about them. It's a really small group, they're really hardworking, they're super smart and they're super committed to what they do. Uh, we partner with them and, and therefore work directly with the industry to increase confidence in these new technologies and best practices. With NACFI, we have actually co-authored four reports on electric trucks, um, including a really great report around charging infrastructure for electric trucks, because that is one of the biggest issues um, when it comes to electrification of fleets, is the charging infrastructure and how you make that happen. And through the course of these four reports, which were written over, I think, a year and a half or something like that, um, we concluded that electrification is definitely coming. It's going to take some time. It's not going to happen all at once. It's going to be an evolving thing. Um, but it is coming, and it's most likely going to start in what we call regional hall. So this is trucks that have generally, like, they don't go farther than, like, 500-mile radius. And the reason it's likely going to start there is because they have more predictable routes. Um, so you can, you can more easily say when a truck will be available for charging. A lot of these regional hall operations, they have return to base operations. So the truck is coming back to a depot or something like that every night. So you can just have your charging station set up there. So it's a really good way for this technology to start. And we really think that that's how it's gonna happen. Another really th cool thing we do with NACFI, it happens every two years, is something called Run On Less. This is a best of the best cross country roadshow to showcase advances in freight efficiency and new technologies. We take 10 drivers. Um, from really high-performing fleets. We ask them to give this their best driver, and over the course of three weeks, we monitor everything on their trucks and analyze that data and see how that compares. So it's, it's a really good way, a really good case study to show the industry what is possible in real-world conditions. 2017 was the first run on less. Um, that was long-haul trucks, so trucks that were actually driving all across the country. They started in their respective areas and actually all converged on this big trucking show that happens in Atlanta every two years. Uh, the really great thing about Run on Less 2017 was that they showed that an average fuel economy of 10 miles per gallon is possible. I know that doesn't sound like a lot, but it's huge. For long haul trucks, it's usually closer to four or five. So that is just really fantastic and amazing. Uh, this past year, in, in 2019, we did Run On Less Regional, which was focused on regional haul. We did not get any electric trucks, was a little, which was a little bit of a bummer. Um, but we still had drivers average 8.3 miles a gallon. That's lower than the 2017 version, but it's a lot of start and stop in these regional haul routes. And that's still 30% more efficient than the national average. So really good stuff. Um, our heavy transport team is also focused on shipping. Um, which is a, definitely not something I thought I would ever work on. <laughs> but it, it's really been a lot of fun and um, definitely a very interesting thing to do because last June we launched something called the Poseidon Principles. We worked on this together with the Global Maritime Forum and the University College of London. And it's essentially a global framework 
um, for assessing and disclosing whether or not financial institution shipping portfolios are climate aligned. This is really a groundbreaking thing because it was the first example of financial institutions coming together to drive greenhouse gas emissions reductions and then do that in line with the climate target. Um, really, like this helped redefine the role of banks and maritime shipping sector, and it has the potential to set the expectation on climate change for the financial sector across the industries. So basically, these big banks, you know, when we launched, we had Citibank and DNB and Societe Generale and a, a few other big banks on board. Um, basically, they all came together and said, okay, something has to change. One of the problems is, you know, they couldn't, in these big industries, a lot of times you have an issue where first movers are penalized um, because these industries are so competitive. If you act on your own, you're just, you're just gonna lose out. If nobody else changes too, you're just gonna become non-competitive. So these banks all came together and agreed that they would move forward on this together. Um, and that's a really, really big step and it was great to be part of that. It's a really interesting, interesting change model and we're looking at how to apply that to other industries as well. And so I think we'll be rolling out other you know, Poseidon principles um, to different industries as time goes on. Last but not least, our aviation team. Uh, these guys are trying really hard to speed the adoption of sustainable aviation fuel. Sustainable aviation fuel is really critical to the long-term health of the uh, airline industry, but it's really just not being used at all. There's, there's so many issues and so many barriers in the way of making it happen. I, I think it's funny, although every time I fly on United and they show that stupid video where they talk about all the great stuff they're doing and the recycling they're doing and how they're using sustainable aviation fuels, I find that completely ridiculous because it's some like fraction of a percentage of the fuel that they're using is actually SAF. And so um, I'm happy to tell anybody around me on the plane that, you know, like this is complete bullshit and <laughs> greenwashing right now and not true at all. Um, but it needs to happen. And at RMI, we're working really hard to make that happen. Um, we've got some work we're doing with the World Economic Forum on that right now. But our real focus has been on um, something called the Good Traveler, which is a carbon offset program, but it's different than other carbon offset programs in the sense that it is focused on doing in-sector offsets. So instead of planting trees, that's projects that go into decarbonizing the aviation industry uh, and, and making the, the industry better itself. Those are hard to do, and, and we haven't had any in-sector offset projects yet. We have the first one coming online very soon within the next month, which is great. But the idea is basically to use that as a funding mechanism for decarbonation within the industry itself. Another thing that's different about The Good Traveler is we actually partner with airports. Um, and, um, you know, so we have direct access to their passengers. We have partnered, you know, we've got partnerships in San Francisco, Atlanta, the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, um, Seattle. All, I think we're up to 14 or 15 airports now and it's kind of growing every month. Um, we're run by an advisory board of 11 airports that represent over 400 million passengers every year. Uh, the carbon impact that we've had is equivalent to reducing um, 300 million passenger, decarbonizing 300 million passenger air miles. And we've done some really cool things as well. Like last year, we actually offset um, the Super Bowl. So it took place in Atlanta. Oh, yeah. Uh, you don't mention DIA, is there a reason? I, I don't know if we have approached DIA. Um, you know, it's, it's, our aviation team is really small. It's actually one person. Um, <laughs> so, you know, it takes a while to make the rounds. Um, I don't know if we've approached them or not. I, I will definitely ask about that tomorrow. Um, I can tell you that Aspen, Pitkin County recently came on board. So we do have them in Colorado. Um, so if you're ever flying through there. <laughs> uh, but it's really great. You know, I, I flew out of... Um, Newark recently, and when I went to log into the Wi-Fi, it directed me to the Good Traveler page, and I mean, it's just really, really great to see. Um, okay, so that's it. That's sort of a whirlwind tour of RMI's industry program and everything that we're trying to do to change the world by 2030. Yeah, thank you guys. Yes. So our targets emissions lower now because 
more people are shopping on Amazon and maybe going to the store less. I mean, I suppose marginally they are because they're potentially getting fewer shipments. I don't think it's that severe yet that it would make a dent. Um, you know, obviously emissions for delivering all those packages are a really big impact. Um, it can be, so shopping, I used to think that shopping on Amazon and getting things delivered to your home was worse uh, in terms of carbon from transportation. If you pick the like the longer shipping options, it's actually it can actually be better because they'll wait and they'll package everything together and batch it to make it more convenient. Two day shipping is terrible. Um, and, and that's a really bad thing. So we all want that convenience. We want stuff as soon as possible, but that's really where the emissions are spiking as a result. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I, um, I'm just curious as to how you go about this here. It's a fairly audacious undertaking. Yeah. Um, and here we are, the Rocky Mountain Institute, and uh, we just want to come in and help you um, decarbonize. Um, so I guess it's a, a, a question of, of what's your entree? How do you make a, an approach to a and you're do, obviously breaking it down by sector. Mm -hmm. um, and so also, which sectors do you find the most amenable to, uh, to your coming in and participating? Um, none of them. <laughs> uh, I will say, I do, I do think the trucking industry, out of all the industries, sees, the, sees it, the opportunity the most. I think they understand that these technologies are coming that they're gonna be really big and revolutionary, and I see them starting to prepare for that change. Uh, in terms of how we, how we start to work with industry, a lot of it is starting small with pers personal relationship building, using that, just doing one project at a time, using that as a case study, and then using that as a proof point. I think in the past we did a lot of word of mouth, you know, so somebody at Rio Tinto says, oh hey, I worked with those guys at RMI, so, you know, um, you guys should too. And going to conferences, just networking, that sort of thing. As we've started to grow and as we're trying to grow our projects, we're starting to work more and more with um, industry organizations to give us access to more companies and that sort of thing. But I do think that unfortunately it's gotta be, there's a lot of just sort of chipping away at it, trying to get your foot in the door and make a difference and form a relationship with somebody at Shell and like hope that they have the ear of somebody high up and that you can use that to, to drive change. I have a question too uh, about China. So uh, yeah. how recent is the addition of the Chinese office and uh, how big is the involvement? I, I got the impression that there is uh, a strong element of interest from the Chinese government mm -hmm. uh, to, to follow RMI's guidance. Yeah, I think that. So I've only been at RMI for about two years now. I think we've been doing work in China for a while but only recently established the office, um, maybe about, I think it had been newly formed when I started, so maybe about two years ago now. Um, it's, it's fairly large, I would say, it's maybe about 20 or 30 people, and we are making a lot of good progress there. It's different though than working here. You do have to partner really strongly with the government, and you do have to make sure that the work you're doing is aligned with the government and their priorities and things like that. Um, so there's a definite like policy sort of working the system component that goes on there. But yeah, they, we are lucky that right now they do seem to be very much aligned with the work that we're doing. I will say though that on the, nat on the natural gas infrastructure side of things, they're not aligned. So they're, you know, we are trying to work really hard to eliminate new gas infrastructure here in the US, whereas they're just building it like crazy. Yeah, this week was the uh, Colorado S Solar Storage Industries National Convention, and they had a panel of all the power supply uh, suppliers from Mississippi West, and the Midwest power supply that powers from North Dakota to Texas has their wind corridor, mm -hmm. and they showed a, a graph that from the 90s to today, uh, coal they expect will be there. I mean, coal is on its way out, wind will be their top producer by the end of this year. That's great. So we all clapped on that. Yeah, that's great. Le Leanne, a uh, very nice talk, thank you. The number that appeared uh, most important to me was that you're combining 
carbon zero in the year 2050 with natural gas as down to 20% remaining. Right. So, so, the, so the difference has got to be in the word carbon negativity. Is RMI working in carbon negativity, taking carbon out of the atmosphere? No, we're not. I mean, we're really honestly focused on just trying to reach net zero by 2050 and 50% emissions targets by 2030. Um, because, I mean, honestly, I don't know that we're going to get there. You know, in, or, in, order, in order to get to net zero by 2050, we have to cut emissions in half, essentially, in the next 10 years. And I mean, I just don't think we're on track to do that at all. Um, so in terms of technologies to remove carbon from the air, um, yeah, we're not we're not really focused on that right now. And almost nobody is. Well, yeah, I that's true. Big yeah, I mean, I think it'll be interesting to see with the ch seven challenges if we if we start to focus on that at all. You know, because I, I think we might start to look into new technologies a little more aggressively, uh, especially if we think that it can offer a really big impact for um, a small effort. I know that today. Um, our, we call it our emerging solutions team. This is something that we formed late last year. So something that is, is um, exists to focus on those new technologies. They did, they were talking to people about carbon capture. Um, so I think it might be something we're starting to look into, but not actively working on it right now. Oh yeah, thank you for your work. Uh, obviously the industry, <laughs> industrial processes are really hard not to crack. I was mm -hmm. just going to mention we presented at the Low Carbon Development Forum in China in September, and part of that Expo RMI had a big uh, pavilion there and oh, great. talked about. It. They're doing transportation studies, I believe, and yes. of course China is doing a, a huge emphasis on hydrogen transportation. But but my question is, I, the other day I saw a Coca-Cola truck all across. It was delivering pop and. All across the side was this huge thing about this is an electric truck and mm. so on. Can you, can you, are you familiar with that program? Can you expand on it? So, um, not with Coca-Cola. So NACFI, which I mentioned, um, actually Pepsi Frito-Lay is on their board. So we don't talk about Coca-Cola at all. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I do, but I do know that, you know, we, we are, RMI, not through NACFI, but RMI on its own is doing some work with FedEx and Amazon has approached us also. Um, to to help work with them on studies about electrification and that sort of thing. Um, and I will say that Pepsi Frito-Lay is trying really hard and has, has a lot of new um, technologies and electric trucks and that sort of thing. Um, UPS, who's also on the NACFI board, um, they're, they're really interested in compressed natural gas, which, which we at RMI obviously aren't supporting because we don't want new gas. Um, but that in the trucking industry is something that people are looking for as well. It is better than traditional gas, but still is a fossil fuel. And then um, we don't like those. Hmm? Question back there. Yeah, I've got a question about your um, uh, steel industry routes uh, and yeah. the resistance to, uh, to upgrade. We kind of saw this movie back in the 90s, and they were slow to, to upgrade and put in new CapEx, and they'd say we're on a 30-year cycle. Mm -hmm. And meanwhile, folks in Asia were on a five-year upgrade cycle and took away their industry, and mm -hmm. many of those plants closed down. Um, do we have to keep repeating the same lesson to learn it again, or are they looking at something that's going to change their, their minds about this? Um, I think they're going to repeat. Honestly, I think they're going to repeat. Um, I think that the steel industry is, and this comes a lot from my experience working there as well. I mean, it's, it's so old school. There's so much inertia that's going on there. And they're also so used to having the government help them and bail them out, um, that they haven't, they haven't been able to change. There's actually this book that talks about this called the innovator's dilemma. And it talks about the steel industry. You're familiar with this book. Yeah. So I, I think that they just don't have the mindset to be able to make that change. And I think that for the foreseeable future, probably as long as you and I will be alive, they're just going to continue to limp along with government assistance. Um, there's sort of this idea that steel is essential to the United States and we need to have a steel industry because, you know, back in like World War II, it was so critical for us. Um, and in case that happens again, you know, we need to have everything within our borders. And I think that 
I don't see that narrative ending, unfortunately, anytime soon. Um, and I don't know what's going to make them change. I think they will change eventually, but I think they're going to be at the very end of the curve when it's when it's kind of really too late. Yeah, I'm curious about um, on that same topic. You said that um, hydrogen was the best option for the steel industry. Is that to burn as a fuel to replace coal in their furnaces? Yes. And what's going to prevent them from falling into the temptation of deriving the hydrogen from natural gas? Uh, and why wouldn't they just burn natural gas if that's if that's the way they go? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think that ultimately we're going to you, you have to have some kind of transparency and accountability, which is definitely really very much lacking right now. I think that you're going to have to see something like I mentioned that the Poseidon principles, which was essentially financial pressure for the shipping industry. You're going to have to see that for the steel industry as well. So people putting pressure on them to have climate targets and be held accountable for it. None of that exists at all right now. Um, and until that, ha until that happens, you're right. I think that, um, yeah, it's, there's no accountability. Quick follow-up. Um, if they do go with hydrogen, the smallest molecule how will they keep it contained? Because if that gets into the atmosphere, it can combine and be a greenhouse gas yeah. creator. That is a question for my colleague who will be speaking at the hydrogen event in March. I don't, I don't know enough about it to be able to comment on that. Question back here. Yeah, thank you so much for the wonderful overview of what you guys are working on. This is a question, and I'm, please take it in the form that was given. Okay. <laughs> um, are there any other sister research institutes like yourself in the United States that are helping you with the long haul? Um, yes. I mean, yes, yes and no. Like, RMI is, there are other people working in the space spaces that we're working in, and we do try to partner with them as much as possible. So for example, on the oil and gas methane side, EDF is actually doing a tremendous amount of work there. Um, WEF is really active in the aviation space. Um, WRI, we work with WRI on, on a number of things as well. Um, there's a lot of organizations in our cities and state, states work through America's Pledge that we're working with. As far as I know, though, there aren't any other NGOs that have the same kind of industry connection and that techno-economic focus. You know, people say that RMI acts like not like an NGO so much as a consultancy, and that's true. We do have a lot of people who are consultants. We have a weird number of people who came from McKinsey. And so we have that sort of attitude and, and vibe and approach to things. And, and I was, to be honest with you, I have a for-profit background, and I was worried about going to work for a nonprofit. But what I liked about RMI is that it doesn't feel like a nonprofit. It still has much more of that drive and that, that view of um, making sure things make economic sense. I have a question in reference to follow up of his question of how do you guarantee they're going to use this or have you studied the use of blockchain, which contains the tariffs and all the uh, money agreements and then can automatically turn on switches with sensors all in that packet of information? Uh, yeah, we do have one crazy guy at RMI who has studied that. And, and knows all about it. I'm not even going to pretend to be able to have a conversation on it, but yes, we have looked into it. Yes, uh, are, are you doing any work in the recycling area? Uh, plastics particularly. Um, yeah, N new markets perhaps for uh, single-use plastics, hmm. um, opportunities for, well, um, uh, uh, substitutions for lumber, that, that kind of thing. And then uh, overall in each of the sectors that you're working with, uh, to what extent does uh, recycling uh, play a role? Hmm. That's a really great question. On the plastics front, I don't think that we are doing anything on that side right now. Um, we have in the industry team 
we have plastics on our list as something we would like to work in eventually, but we don't have the resources to do it right now. Um, even though RMI is growing, we're still really small. The industry team is only about 20 people. So all of that work I just talked about is done by only about 20 people. Uh, we're hoping to expand our team over the next few years and, and be able to focus on both cement and plastics. In terms of recycling, I don't think we really focus on it as an organization. Not that we don't think that it's important, but um, for whatever reason, uh, we don't we don't do work in that area, um, which is interesting. You know, I know Amory's big focus. He's really big on efficiency technologies, and I do see us gravitating away from that a little bit too. We still think it's important, but we're not pushing it as much as we used to. Now it's really about the fuel switchings and and these these really big bang technologies. Um, and I don't know why that's happened. Um, yeah, w w one of the most interesting things I learned tonight um, uh, uh, was when you said that industry is probably going to repeat their mistakes from back then. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think um, maybe what we would need uh, in addition to an organization like RMI is one that does industry shaming. Yes. At a professional level, because I mean, uh, these uh, these are uh, giant multinational companies that are probably um, uh, working themselves out of business mm -hmm. because uh, they're too slow um, to react to changes that need to happen, and that are also changes that will make them not competitive, mm -hmm. um, especially in a global market where you have to compete with uh, Europe with higher standards, for instance. So. Uh, I always think of uh, Emery Lovins as the um, the high priest of the low-hanging fruit, because uh, <laughs> for the, the entirety of his uh, existence uh, and work, mm -hmm. uh, he's always pointed out the low-hanging fruit in uh, in what uh, you can do on a fairly large scale uh, to bring down cost and Im improve uh, your business's uh, bottom line. So. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I'm I'm really appreciative uh, appreciative for uh, what RMI is doing on that on that front. I just wish more people would uh, would take notice. Uh, and I recently talked to uh, a former president of Cress, uh, Doug Sider, um, and he said one of the big um, uh, things he he wonders about is why isn't RMI much better known because the the quality of the work is really outstanding. I mean, th mm -hmm. these are, um, you mentioned that uh, your work feels more like being consultants and consultants have a bad rep, basically. They always say, do this, uh, but they're not really deep into it. But mm -hmm. with RMI's report, I always had the impression that um, this is very closely um, um, tailored to what a particular industry needs to do if they want to get results. So, yeah. um, thank you all for coming. Uh, and um, with that, have a good evening. Okay. Thank you, guys.